According to Graham Hancock, as technology advances and the jungle becomes less dense, something that used to be considered a made-up story is now undeniable truth. And according to new discoveries, there's no question that the Nabataean Kingdom was a unique and very different lost civilization than anything we've seen in the 21st century. As Graham Hancock explains, these people had a unique knowledge that is far beyond our understanding. With new discoveries, we learned about the Nabataean's strange and powerful abilities, but with what scientists just discovered about this civilization, turns everything upside down on what we knew about our history. Graham Hancock has written about the Nabataean Kingdom in his book, Magicians of the Gods. In the book, he discusses the possibility of a lost civilization that predates the known history of the Nabataeans and suggests that they inherited advanced knowledge and architectural techniques from this earlier civilization. Hancock proposes that the Nabataeans, who were an ancient Arab civilization that thrived in the region of modern-day Jordan, had access to advanced astronomical and engineering knowledge. He suggests that their rock-cut architecture, particularly the famous city of Petra, was not solely the result of the Nabataeans' own ingenuity, but was influenced by a more ancient civilization that possessed advanced technology. Hancock points to various features of the Nabataean sites, such as a precise alignment with celestial phenomena and complex hydraulic engineering, as evidence of advanced knowledge that he believes would have been beyond the capabilities of the Nabataeans themselves. But what do we know about this civilization? Well, the Nabataean kingdom was a strong and influential government that thrived in what is now Jordan, from around 400 BC to 106 AD. Today, it is famous for the ruins of its main city, Petra. While there is evidence of a prosperous community near Petra, as early as 312 BC, historians generally consider the official start of the Nabataean kingdom to be in 168 BC, when their first king came to power. The kingdom lasted until 106 AD, when it was taken over by the Roman Empire, specifically under the rule of Emperor Trajan. The Nabataeans were nomadic people from the Arabian region who lived in the Najev Desert. They gained their riches by being traders among the incense routes. These routes stretch from Kataban in present-day Yemen through Sabah, an important trading center, all the way to Gaza on the Mediterranean Sea. The Nabataeans traveled these routes regularly, which made them very familiar with the area. They were skilled at locating and preserving sources of water, which allowed them to transport goods faster and more efficiently than others. In 1900, a team of archaeologists led by the British scholar and explorer George Horsfield conducted extensive surveys and excavations at Petra. They documented and studied the numerous tombs, temples, theatres and other structures carved into the rose-coloured sandstone cliffs. This research helped shed light on the architecture, urban planning and cultural practices of the Nabataean civilization. Horsfield's team also uncovered important artifacts, such as inscriptions and pottery, which provided valuable insights into the Nabataean's trade networks, religion and daily life. The discoveries made in 1900 and subsequent archaeological work at Petra have greatly expanded our knowledge of the Nabataean kingdom and its significance as a thriving ancient civilization. Today, Petra is a UNESCO World Heritage Site and is one of the most iconic archaeological sites in the world. So, the Nabataeans built their city, Petra, by carving it into the sandstone cliffs of mountains. This location was not easy to reach, and they chose to build there after becoming wealthy from their trade. For a long time, scholars and historians have been puzzled by their decision to build in such an inhospitable place, with no natural water source nearby. However, upon closer examination, it becomes clear that their choice of location was actually quite strategic. Being situated at Petra allowed the Nabataeans to keep a close eye on the incense routes and collect taxes from the caravans passing through their territory. This further enriched them, and the difficult accessibility of the city provided protection against potential threats. After being taken over by the Roman Empire in 106 AD, cities like Petra and Hagra, which were part of the Nabataean kingdom, gradually lost their influence over the incense routes and their control over the region. This decline was due to the emergence of Palmyra, a city in Syria which became a major trade hub. Caravans started passing through the Nabataean cities, resulting in a decrease in their wealth and prestige. Although the Emperor Aurelian destroyed Palmyra in around 272 AD, it was too late to revive the Nabataean economy. By the time of the Arab invasion in the 7th century AD, the Nabataean kingdom had been forgotten. The term incense routes refers to various paths that traders followed between southern Arabia and the port of Gaza from the 7th-6th centuries BC to the 2nd century AD. 
During the 3rd century BC, trade along these routes became highly profitable, especially after the Nabataeans gained control over the most significant cities along the routes. The incense routes don't represent a single specific road, but rather a general direction that merchants travel between Arabia and Gaza. According to Pity the Elder, these routes spanned 1,931 kilometers and took around 65 days to complete one way, with an overnight stop at a city whenever possible. The stops along the incense routes were not just for taking a break, but were actually crucial for business. For instance, Mamshit was known for its Arabian horses, which were highly valued and could be sold at a high price. Merchants would travel from one city to another, trading their goods at each stop before eventually reaching the final destination of Gaza port. If certain cities started imposing heavy taxes on merchants, trades would shift towards more welcoming cities. However, the cities controlled by the Nabataeans since the 3rd century BC had become so important for trade along the routes that they couldn't be bypassed or avoided. Among the cities along the incense routes were Halusa, Mamshit, Avdat, and Shifta. These cities not only provided goods for trade, but also offered comfortable places for traders to stay. The Nabataeans built forts along the routes to ensure the safety of merchants. However, they charged a fee for their protection, just like the taxes they imposed on traders. While the Nabataeans were already prosperous as traveling merchants by the 3rd century BC, their wealth grew even more once they established their kingdom and gained tight control over the incense routes. The Nabataeans achieved remarkable success by taking control of water sources along the trade routes. While other Arabian tribes had to negotiate for water, the Nabataeans dug cisterns that filled with rainwater. They cleverly covered and marked these cisterns with symbols known only to them. This strategy allowed them to travel more easily compared to their trade rivals. Furthermore, they found a solution to the water problem in Petra through their innovative technology. The Nabataeans developed an impressive system for transporting and conserving water, which was unmatched at the time and still stands as an exceptional feat in the region. Despite facing occasional flash floods in the area, the Nabataeans ingeniously constructed dams, cisterns, and aqueducts. These efforts created an artificial oasis in an otherwise arid region. The oasis not only provided sustenance for the Nabataeans, but also elevated their kingdom to become the most influential power in the area. The exact timeline of when cities like Petra and Hagra were built remains uncertain, but they were already well established by the late 4th century BC. During this time, the Nabataeans had accumulated significant wealth, catching the attention of Antigonus I, a Greek general who would later become a king. In 312 BC, Antigonus pretended to be friendly with the Nabataeans and then launched a surprise attack on Petra, sending his son Demetrius to carry out the assault. However, the Nabataeans were not deceived and were prepared for Demetrius' attack. Their defensive efforts were successful and Demetrius' offensive failed. He eventually made peace with the Nabataeans and returned to his father. Both Antigonus and Demetrius were later driven out of the region in a subsequent conflict with the Nabataeans. While the Nabataeans were an influential and prominent civilization in their own right, there were several other civilizations that coexisted with them during their existence. These civilizations played significant roles in shaping the cultural, economic, and political landscape of the ancient world. One of the most prominent civilizations that existed contemporaneously with the Nabataeans was the Roman Empire. During the height of the Nabataean civilization, the Romans had already established their dominance over much of the Mediterranean region and beyond. The Nabataeans had a complex relationship with the Romans, at times forming alliances and benefiting from trade with them, while at other times engaging in conflicts. The Romans eventually annexed the Nabataean kingdom in 106 AD, incorporating it into the province of Arabia Petraea. Another civilization that coexisted with the Nabataeans was the Hellenistic civilization, particularly during the early years of the Nabataean kingdom. The Hellenistic period followed the conquests of Alexander the Great and saw the spread of Greek culture and influence across the eastern Mediterranean and beyond. The Nabataeans adopted and adapted elements of Hellenistic culture, including architecture and artistic styles, while maintaining their distinctive cultural identity. The interaction between the Nabataeans and the Hellenistic world influenced both civilizations and contributed to a rich cultural exchange. The Parthian Empire, a major power in the Near East during the Nabataean era, also interacted with the Nabataeans. The Parthians controlled territories in modern-day Iran and Iraq and engaged in trade and diplomacy with the Nabataeans. The caravan routes that connected the Nabataean kingdom to the Parthian Empire were vital conduits for commerce, facilitating the exchange of goods and ideas between the two civilizations. Furthermore, the existence of the Nabataean kingdom was enormous 
and gained widespread fame during its existence. Even centuries later, historians like Strabo, who lived until around 23 AD, and Diodorus Siculus made references to their immense riches. These writers, along with others, consistently portrayed the Nabataeans in a favorable manner. In his histories, Diodorus specifically discusses the wealth and customs of the Nabataeans in Book 19. Strabo's account of the Nabataeans aligns with Diodorus's overall portrayal, but there is one notable difference regarding their drinking customs. Strabo contradicts Diodorus by stating that the Nabataeans actually grew grapes for making wine and enjoyed drinking it during banquets. However, Strabo emphasizes that unlike the Romans, the Nabataeans didn't indulge in excessive drinking. They limited themselves to a maximum of 11 cups of wine throughout an evening. Additionally, Strabo describes how the Nabataeans preferred camels over horses for transportation, wore loincloths instead of tunics, and had a strong democratic culture. In fact, their king would insist on serving others at a banquet, highlighting their egalitarian values. In Nabataean culture, women held a position of equality with men. Inscriptions provide evidence that women served as priestesses, co-rulers, or even independent monarchs. They had the right to inherit and manage property, own their own tombs, could initiate legal proceedings and represent themselves in court, and were even featured on coins. Interestingly, some of the most revered deities in the Nabataean pantheon were female, including Alehusa, Manuat, and Alat. Our knowledge of the religious customs of the Nabataeans is limited, but we do know that they practiced polytheism and that they held the sun in high regard. They conducted ceremonies on the rooftops of temples to worship the sun, and they also honored their gods through private rituals conducted at home. There was a priestly class within their society that both men and women could join, but the process of selection and the training required for priesthood remain unknown. It is likely that, similar to Egypt, the priest and priestesses primarily served the gods rather than the people. It seems that the Nabataeans did not have organized public worship services, apart from their participation in festivals and celebrations. The gods of the Nabataeans were not depicted in large statues, but rather their images were carved into doorways, temple corners, and could easily be found on coins, tombs, ceramics, as well as amulets and charms. During the early stages of the culture, the three most significant gods were Alquam, al Kubbi, and al -Uza. These gods played crucial roles in the religious beliefs and practices of the Nabataeans, although they were not typically depicted in the form of large statues. In later times, additional deities emerged in the Nabataean pantheon. These included Manoat, who was the goddess associated with destiny and fertility, Alat, who represented renewal, spring, and fertility, and Dushara, often referred to as Dushes, the god linked to mountains, daytime, and the sun. Among these deities, Dushara was the most enduring and continued to be worshipped from the rooftops of Nabataean temples. Even after the Roman annexation of Nabataea, Dushara remained significant and continued to be depicted on coins. The Nabataeans were literate people who contributed to the development of the Arabic script. However, most of the knowledge we have about their culture customs and rulers comes from the writing of Greek and Roman authors. We can also gain insights from their architectural structures, artwork, and short inscriptions that they left behind. As the Nebataean kingdom grew and interacted more with neighboring regions, they encountered both contact and conflicts with other nations. Consequently, the kings of the Nabataeans gained recognition and are mentioned more frequently in the writings of those nations. However, still, the Nabataeans had their own unique writing system, known as the Nabataean script. It was a form of Aramaic writing that developed and evolved within the Nabataean kingdom. The script was used primarily for inscriptions on rock, monuments, and tombs, as well as for commercial and administrative purposes. Under Roman rule, the cities of the Nabataeans experienced a decline, and around 363 AD, an earthquake caused significant damage to many of these cities. The region eventually came under the control of the Eastern Roman Empire, also known as the Byzantine Empire. The Byzantines established churches in the cities, and worked to revive commerce. However, another destructive earthquake struck around 551 AD, causing further widespread destruction. By the time of the Arab invasion in the 7th century AD, the Nabataean cities had been abandoned for a long time, and the Nabataeans themselves were largely forgotten. The cities of the Nabataeans, particularly Petra, remained hidden and forgotten for centuries, until the 19th century AD, when European explorers started to venture into the area. The captivating city of Petra played a significant role in drawing attention to the Nabataean culture. Throughout the 20th century AD, more scholars and archaeologists visited the region and conducted excavations at the ancient sites, which further fueled interest in the Nabataeans. 
In 1985 AD, Petra was recognized as a World Heritage Site, and in 2007 AD, it was chosen as one of the new Seven Wonders of the World. The Nabataeans were exceptionally skilled in the art of masonry, as demonstrated by the remarkable structures that still exist in Petra. The mastery in this craft was unparalleled in the ancient world. Their ability to seize every opportunity that came their way played a vital role in their success, allowing them to become the wealthiest kingdom in the region. Despite being forgotten for many centuries, the Nabataeans are now acknowledged as a highly advanced culture. They not only managed to survive the harsh climate of the region, but also flourished in it, leaving a lasting legacy of their remarkable achievements. Moreover, Saudi Arabia has revealed a new creation that shows us what an ancient Nabataean woman may have looked like. It took a long time for historians and archaeologists to put this together. This is the first time something like this has been done. They used the remains of a woman named Hinat, who was found in a really old tomb in Hegra, a place in the city of Alula, which was once a bustling oasis. This all happened back in 2015, and now we finally get to see what she might have looked like. Thanks to the Royal Commission for Alula's support, the process of reconstructing Hinat started in the United Kingdom. A team of experts from different fields came together to piece together the bone fragments found in the tomb. By using information from anthropology and archaeology, they were able to create a picture of how she may have looked. Finally, a sculpture used a 3D printer to bring her face into existence. The Nabataean civilization didn't write down a lot of history books, so we don't have many written records about them. Instead, we have to rely on inscriptions found on tombs and rocks across the Middle East, as well as what archaeologists have discovered. These sources give us a glimpse into the lives and culture of the Nabataeans. The Nabataeans are a bit of a mystery. We know a lot, but at the same time we know very little because they didn't leave any literary texts or records. Lebanese French archaeologist the Alanim, the director of the project, told National Geographic, excavating this tomb was a wonderful opportunity to learn more about their idea of the afterlife. Neem explained that the alphabet used by the Nabataeans eventually transformed into the Arabic alphabet that they use today. She also mentioned that the tomb they discovered has a fascinating inscription on its front side. The inscription reveals that the tomb belonged to a woman named Hinnit. It's interesting to point out that the Nabataean kingdom derived its name from the Nabataeans, the ancient Arab people who established and ruled the kingdom. The Nabataeans were a Semitic-speaking people who inhabited the region of modern-day Jordan, southern Syria, and northwestern Saudi Arabia. And that's it for today. Subscribe to our channel and hit the notification bell.